Well, hello, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. If this is your first time listening, welcome. If you've listened before, hello to you too. I'm your host, Cindy House. Nice to have you here. Today's guest I am so excited about. I met her at Folk Alliance, which is this huge folk music convention that took place in the before quarantine times in New Orleans. I met her at an event called Meet the Folk DJ, which is kind of like speed dating for musicians and folk DJs. I would have been extremely intimidated, but it was really fun. I met tons of very nice musicians there, including Danielle, who stood out to me when she was talking to me immediately. I was like, you need, I feel like you would really like my podcast, Basic Folk. And she's like, why? Because I'm where, because I'm basic and I'm wearing a Pete Seeger pin. And I said, yes. And I handed her um, a sticker and then like made a mental note that like she definitely needs to be on the podcast. She's an incredible singer songwriter. She once earned the nickname the Lyric Doctor due to her intrinsic ability to channel human feelings through songs like an actual medical doctor. This woman was born to make you cry, feel, and emote. Now Danielle calls Toronto home, but the musician was born and raised on the prairies in Alberta, Canada. She knew that performing was what she wanted to pursue even as a young kid. She discovered songwriting after attending the Edmonton Folk Festival at the age of 12, taught herself to play the guitar, and started playing for anyone who would listen. Danielle also plays in a band with her husband Connor Walsh and longtime bandmate Bryn Bessie. She talks about what it's like to play with her husband, and apparently they don't perform together well as a duo, which was hilarious to hear her talk about. We also talk about the concept of ribcage songs, you know, when you're feeling guarded, and then vulnerable or heart songs. Danielle is kind, funny, empathetic, and a blast to talk to. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I took like a fish to water to her music. Hope you enjoy. We'll hear a clip of her song, Agony, and then we'll get to our conversation with Danielle Knippy on Basic Book. I've been thinking about us, thinking about love, thinking about falling to pieces. I've been thinking that maybe I've been wrong all this time. Cause I've been watching you walk, watching you talk, watching you stand in hands and pockets. I've been wondering how to live if you're not in my life, if you're not. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Cindy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to talk to you. Thanks for being on the podcast. I'm very excited. I've only been talking to, you know, my mom and my husband for a really long time. So this is great. Great. Are you ready to get uh, really deep with a stranger? Oh, to be honest, probably too ready. That's my (laughs) biggest problem. (laughs) All right, let's do it. All right. You were raised in Edmonton. Is that right? That is right. Alberta. On the prairies. You had a musical family growing up, and I'm wondering like how music was approached in your family, whether it was like a social thing or like a very structured, serious thing. Yeah. So it was a combination. A big part of the music in my family, going back to like my grandparents and my great grandparents, is related through like going to church and singing hymns. And my grandfather was an organist. And so music was always kind of integrated with that. Um, but on top of that, my everybody in my family is really musical and my family is huge. So sometimes I'm really worried that more of them will decide to pursue music. Competition. And all the things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the things that make me like special, I'm not that special. There's like a million Dutch blonde Kennedy kids out there who could do what I'm doing. And luckily, they've chosen to become like interior designers or something. But, uh, you know, we sing at the piano together and we sing like Ben Folds at the piano and we sing Christmas carols. And it's funny because my family is not a big music listening family. We're much more doers than we are. Mm appreciators uh so like my mom like if I try to put music on she's like oh that's just very distracting 
And so she'll turn it off. But in terms of actively doing music, we all took lessons growing up. We all sing. We all play violin and viola and whatever. It was always really, really important. The arts in general, I have a lot of like visual artists in my family as mm-hmm. well, going back generations. So it's it's kind of this weird, like my parents had no problem with me becoming a musician. Well, they were hoping I'd make like more money. But when I was like, no, I think music is what I want to do. They were like, well, okay, go for it. <laughs> um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about your relationship to how you like first started playing music. Um, you took piano lessons and you were mentioning that you would sing in church and what your relationship to those two experiences were like and how did they make you feel about making music? I took piano lessons for seven years and I managed to not learn how to read music during any of those seven Nice years. job. Thank you. I feel like that's a, <laughs> that's a skill on its own. It's especially funny because I am a music teacher now <laughs> and I see that in children and I'm like, I know what you're doing and I respect it, but I hate it. It's not going to uh, work. No, it's not going to work on me. Uh, so I, I did that for seven years and then I switched to viola for four years and I realized that there was a whole new clef that I had to not learn. So I didn't learn that one either. And then when I wanted to learn guitar, my parents were like, we have sunk so much money into you learning things that you refuse to learn. So I had to teach myself guitar. Um, Oh, that was the deal. That was the deal. Well, my parents were like, you can figure this out on your own, obviously. Uh, So I think my dad showed me a handful of chords and then, and then I, I had to learn it on my own. And I remember I switched to guitar because I couldn't sing and play viola at the same time. And I really wanted to write songs and I really wanted to sing. And so I taught myself guitar mostly so I could put chords to all these songs I was writing, these terrible, terrible songs. <laughs> um, and so that was when I was like 12 or 13, I took up guitar. I managed to resist learning music uh, while being a very musical kid until I wanted to get into university. And then I was like, oh, there's expectations for knowledge in these buildings of learning. Did it make so, it yeah, less that was, fun? Like when you when the, you had to actually like learn the learn how to do it? It's really weird. I'm really stubborn. And I didn't think I was very stubborn, but looking back on my whole experience, I think it would have been way more fun if I just done the homework and learned it and not been so resistant to it. Because even when I went to university, I was learning it while simultaneously trying not to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I'm going to learn what these chords are. But when I write songs, I'm still going to just go by feel, Um, which, you know, it could have been a lot easier because you start realizing you're like, oh, these chords go together because they're all in the same key. That would have been easier to figure out. Um, (laughs) And I did like a composition diploma and I remember doing my first class of composition and being like, I don't even know how to notate anything. Like I was very behind and I I think I did myself a disservice. But at the same time, I think I learned how to put the, I mean, every everybody who writes is different, but I think in doing it that way, I learned to put like the emotion and the lyrics first and I'm, I feel like I'm still always playing catch up on the music side of things, which is funny. <laughs> it's become more fun. And honestly, I've felt the most comfortable with theory now that I've become like a, I teach private lessons on the side and that having to like talk about it every day was really when it started feeling natural. And so this new record I'm writing is probably going to be the most, I'm going to have the most involvement in like the arrangement. Hmm side of it because I feel much more confident with that mm. side of things. You started putting music to your writing when you were like maybe 12. Is that right? Mm-hmm. What made you want to write music and how did it feel to first express yourself like this? How did it go when you first started performing for people? I started, I've always loved writing and I think songwriting for me um always comes back to lyrics. Like I think if I were just an instrumentalist, I probably wouldn't have decided to do this for a job because I like, I like playing guitar, but I wouldn't like, I wouldn't be like, this is how I should make my money, <laughs> which would be a good choice. Cause I don't think I excel at that. But, um, 
But with writing, I loved writing stories and I loved telling stories and I loved poetry. And so that's where it started. And I was just a really confident kid. I had a lot of, uh, I don't know where it came from. It's all gone now. <laughs> but as a child, I was like, why wouldn't I be able to do this? Like, why wouldn't I be able to write songs? And so I remember in the fifth grade, I made up a fake band with some kids from my class. None of us, I was the only one who played an instrument. Um, I also think maybe I was the only one who actually, in my mind, it was like a group effort, but I think it might have just, like, I was like, you guys are in my band now. And I think that's as far as they were. But I'd made like a band name and I'd made t shirts in my mind and set up social and then media I was, profiles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if I could have, I would have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had like, I made up a theme song. I think I was really into S Club 7. So we were called, in my mind, we were called 42BG because there was, uh, four girls and two boys. It was pretty smart. Wow. And then I was like, well, I have a band and now I should write songs. And so I remember that being like the catalyst, which is such a That's dumb hilarious. reason to start writing songs. Oh yeah. But I was like, here we go. Got the fake band together. Got to get that material going. And so that's how I started. And then I really vividly remember the moment where I was like, hold the phone. I have these songs, but I don't think they're songs because they're just words and melodies in my brain that I would record onto a cassette because those were solid gold and I didn't want to forget them. <laughs> um, and then I remember the day that I was like, oh, if I put chords to this, it's a song. And it was the most, like, I think I, I think I just sat in my room with that information for a good 20 minutes being like, holy smokes, like that could be a thing. And then once I have chords with it, then I could like present them to people. And that was the most, one of the most exciting moments that I can remember at, in that early songwriting period of being like, oh, I could like actually do this. Like this doesn't have to be just in my mind. So that was where it started. And then I started slowly showing songs to people, mostly at school, at events where people had to listen to me <laughs> uh, and couldn't leave captive audiences. But I like often- talent shows, the, you mean? Yeah, to any, any really, again, this is the confidence of a child situation. Mm. Anytime- they needed any sort of performance or if they didn't need a performance, I would make it happen. Like my school didn't really do talent shows, but I organized one <laughs> in the seventh grade <laughs> because I was like, people need to hear me sing only hope by Mandy Moore. They need to, they need to know about this. Definitely. Um, or like we would have our school dances and they were like, I guess we could have people play songs during the dinner if they want to. And I was like, done. I'm ready. <laughs> Sign me up. Uh, but I would try not to tell people that they were songs that I'd written. I would try to keep that secret. I so thought I was being really sneaky. You would play them, but then not tell anyone that you'd written them? Yeah, I'd be like, this song is called A Long Way to Go. And then I would just launch into it. And I thought I was being really sneaky. I'm sure they knew because they were like, this is not that great of a song. Oh. <laughs> but uh, But I thought I was really sneaking in there. Yeah, speaking of confidence in reading about like the history of you discovering that music was your was your career aspiration. It seems like you've kind of always known that you wanted to be a performer like starting to sing with your friends when you were like 5 years old singing Shania Twain and then discovering songwriting was a possibility. Uh I read that you figured that out after you went to the Edmonton Folk Festival when you were like 12. And then from there, it seems like you set yourself on this track to your career. And one question, like I remember being like, not only when I was a kid, like not only being like so bored by this question, but also like kind of freaked out was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, so I'm wondering how you relate to that. Like what is your experience with being so sure of your aspirations? Well, I really wish I could have held on to it, to be honest. Like, it wasn't from my parents. My parents were not the type of parents where they were like, everything you do is amazing. <laughs> they were very clear about what my skills were and what my skills were not. Um, I had this, like, pretty unshakable belief in myself that I was like, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to write these songs and people are going to hear it and it's going to be great. It was a very naive approach to it. And my mom actually, like, she has some siblings that are visual artists and, and she would try and be like, you know, if you decide to do music, like, 
there's a lot of other sides to it. She's like, you're going to have to learn how to like promote yourself and you're going to have to learn the business side. Like she came at it with very level headedness. And um, I think I always had a bit of reticence of like saying I'm going to be a musician. So I would never say that to people. I'd be like, well, I might study music and maybe I'll be a lawyer. But in my mind, I was always I'm going to do music. And it's been really interesting the reality of being a musician is quite different. Um, and it's been interesting trying to trying to move away from those goals that I had that aren't really serving me. Like, they're not really what I want. And the older I get, the more I realize kind of what I'd have to sacrifice in order to get those goals. And um, hmm. it's hard to kind of move away from that. You it's must a be in your 30s. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm 29. <laughs> Can you tell? You're ahead of the game. It's, it's oh yeah. I mean, I've been I've been life crisising for eight years. I'm ready, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it, it there's a part of it that feels like it's almost like I have a lot of pressure from my younger self for being so sure and and being so sure that this is what I would want, um, and realizing that it's not in a lot of ways, a lot of parts of being a musician are not what I want and they're not serving me, um, and I mean quarantine is a really great time to really dig into those feelings. <laughs> so so it's interesting. I kind of swing between being like, oh my goodness, my younger self would be so proud of me. Like I've done all this stuff. That's amazing. Uh, and also being like, but also my younger self would be like, stop being such a baby and just go do this. So I feel like it's, it's, it's like it, it can... helped me get to where I am, but it also makes me feel terrible sometimes. <laughs> right. Which, which leads us to our next topic, anxiety. Oh, Yay! I read that you are a fairly anxious person. Is that true? Oh, I would say so, yeah. Yeah. So I guess we're just like expanding on this a little bit in that how do you think that this part of you has like held you back in life and how has it propelled you forward? Yeah, that's a really big question. Anxiety is a lovely genetic gift that runs in my family. I think I can probably think of more ways it's held me back than, than propelled me forward. Uh, in terms of my career. I would I think, think, I would think even it would be interesting even to hear like outside of your career, like in your day to day life, you know, like was anxiety the thing that is making you realize like, Hey, you know what? Maybe I don't want to be on the voice or, right. you know, something like, something like that. Yeah, I mean, if it leads you to like a happier place, you know, because I always think of like, I also have some anxiety myself. And I feel like it's my weakest quality, but also it's like one of my strongest qualities. Right. Well, I will say I was talking with someone the other day about. So my biggest issue with. Um, with my career is that I just, I'm, I can't push myself. Like, and I think this is a big part of where my anxiety is, is helpful. I'm not the kind of person who can like push myself to a breakdown. Like my anxiety, I get alerts <laughs> of like, your emotional well being is really bad right now. Get I get alerts. those very quickly. Yeah. Whereas some people, I feel a notification. Like, like, yeah, exactly. Whereas my, <laughs> So my anxiety manifests itself very quickly in these very, like, obvious ways. Um, whereas someone like my husband, he also feels anxiety, but he doesn't spend as much time with it, I think. He's not as good of friends with his as I am. <laughs> and so his manifests in, like, physical ways. So he'll, like, get a cold or he'll, like, get really tired. And he'll be like, I don't know why I'm tired. Whereas I'll be like, man, I, I, I can't, like, breathe properly. I feel like maybe I'm <laughs> overdoing things. And it's a way of um, being like, okay, which parts of my career are making my life really, really stressful? And do I still want to do those even though I feel anxiety? So performing is an example of like, I always feel a bit of anxiety, but the benefits of it far outweigh the, it's like a good barometer, I guess. Whereas touring, I hate it so much <laughs> and it makes me so uptight and I'm starting to realize that like, I don't want to, and I always come back from tour with some sort of like physical illness because I think I, the anxiety is so high for such an extended period of time. 
And so that's been a really, it's a good barometer of being like, okay, this makes me anxious, but I like doing it. So I'm going to keep doing it. This makes me anxious and I hate it and it's not really serving me. So I'm going to reject it and take a breather from it. And so that's been an interesting benefit for sure. Connor Walsh is your husband um, Mm -hmm. who plays upright bass in your band. What is it like for you to play with your spouse? And also, how hard is it to, like, write about him or, like, any of your friends and family and let him hear those songs? Like, what is that understanding like? Right. Playing with him, and I don't think he'd mind me saying this, is terrible. (laughs) In the (laughs) sense that we can't, we have a really hard time when it's just the two of us. We're practicing a lot during quarantine because we have to. But normally when we play together, it's me and Connor and then our, our mutual friend, Bryn, who plays guitar. How do you say Bryn's and last name? Bessie, like a cow. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but we, we approach music like from complete opposite sides. If I'm all creativity and feeling, he's all like math and perfection. <laughs> and so... I think people have this really romantic idea of being in a band with your partner, but it's it's like a lot of work. It's a lot of work balancing um, how we relate to each other as a couple and how we relate to each other as musicians. Um, but we're getting better at it, and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else. Like I think I think we both push each other quite a bit, but it's definitely active work. He has been in a lucky situation for the last kind of two years because most of the stuff I've written about him have been love songs. <laughs> but but uh, but now we've been married for three years and I'm sure it's going to turn at some point. Like a love like, babe. Have to play. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's very, he's the nicest person. He's like one of those people, if you were meeting someone and they'd be like, describe Danielle, you, they'd be like loud. <laughs> and and, they, and they'd be like, describe Connor. And they'd be like, really nice he's just very nice so i think i could write it i could write a song talking about how he was a terrible person i would never but i could do that and i'd be like listen i wrote this song and i think it's really important that we play it and he'd be like okay <laughs> and he would do it <laughs> he would do it and he'd probably be okay with it and yeah there's only been the only real place that he draws a line he lets me talk about him on stage and I talk about him a lot on stage. But every once in a while, he's like, I want you to take that story out. And I'm like, fair enough. Okay, um, uh, here's a quote about you. It says, her songs invite the listener into what feels like an intimate conversation between friends. So I read that line and thought about our very brief, like, real-life interaction. We met at Folk Alliance for, like, five minutes. And I was also thinking about how fun and like emotionally open even that like brief interaction was like sometimes i don't know if you feel this way i feel like there are people that i just like crave interaction with because they allow a space for emotional intimacy and i'm wondering how you relate to that and how do you find your own interactions with people and do you feel like that person to me i'm like you're great i want to talk to you all the time that's nice (laughs) um that was a really lovely meeting, first of all. When we met, we were at this, like, radio DJ thing at Folk Alliance, and I met a lot it's of, like... It's like speed dating. It's like speed dating with, like, a lot of people who don't really want to be there. <laughs> so it's like speed dating with unwilling participants. So I just remember we had, like, an actual, like, nice conversation, and I was so happy because every other one... Like, they were going fine, but it was a, it was a lot. I think I, I really like getting to know people. Um, it's kind of my favorite, like I, I, my sister was making fun of me. I have a lot of very close friends, like people I would call, um, like on the tier of best friend. Um, and my, I hate parties and I make a lot of jokes about how I hate people, but I don't hate people. I just don't (laughs) like, I don't like crowds of people. And it's funny as a musician, not to like crowds and not like going out, but I love, um, having friends over and talking to them until two o'clock in the morning. And I love getting to know people. And I'm, I would say probably borderline overly empathetic to the point where it causes problems for me emotionally. But, um, wow. I yeah, can't. I can't turn it off, which is yeah. frustrating, you know, so I'll dwell on things for a long time. But it's the main thing that I always try to do with songwriting. I think 
this this whole job becomes a lot easier when you have more and more clarity of of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And for me, I started writing songs partially because I wanted to, but a big part of it was I had a lot to get off my chest and I didn't know how to say it. And that to me has always been the most rewarding part of writing a song is is the more I find the more honest I can be about what I'm feeling, the more it resonates with people. And I think it's the same in like my social situations. Uh, I'm very open. That's why I always get nervous for these types of interviews, because I I'll be in a car with someone that I've never met before and we're never going to hang out again. And by the end of it, I've told them my whole life story. I know everything about them. (laughs) I know like their relationship problems. I know about their like childhood trauma. Like it just happens. And so it's this interesting parallel where that's what I want from my interactions with people face to face. And that's what I want people to feel when they listen to my music and, and when they come to a show and, and none of it's forced because I don't see the point in, in doing the music if it's not for the, not for the connection or not for making someone feel less alone because otherwise I would just do it for fun and have a job that paid me better. (laughs) So I'm working on a new record right now and I'm, trying to push myself to write about the things that I feel even more uncomfortable with. Uh, And so that's been a really interesting process because there are still things that I'm like, well, I'll share things, but I won't share this much. And I'm trying to work on sharing even the this much, because I think it's important that people feel less alone. Um, And there's lots of things that I would have loved to hear a song about that I... Mm that would have made me feel less alone growing up. And that's a, that's a big um, motivator for me as well. Yeah. The rib cage songs are, they, you said they're still from that same truth, but they're more defensive and aggressive hiding behind humor or anger or frustration, more hidden or protective. But in thinking about like these two sides, like I think it's really all about a balance, you know, because you don't want to be vulnerable all the time. Um, when do you see a benefit in accessing that side of yourself, the rib cage? Oh, I mean, any time that someone's trying to hurt you, the rib cage side is incredibly important. Like I even think to, um, I had a couple experiences at Folk Alliance where, you know, um, for those of you that don't know, it's a big folk conference and you go. And as an artist, it's a really uncomfortable thing because it's basically like four days of trying to make people like you (laughs) in a very short amount of time. Uh, And knowing also that you've spent a lot of money to go and try and make people like you. So it's this weird pressure filled thing um, where you're like networking and you're trying not to make it feel like you're networking, but you're also obviously there to network. And there were a couple times where some of the people that you're chatting with aren't always nice and aren't always they're not always interested in being open and vulnerable. You know, they don't want to do that. So then it's really important. There were a couple times where I'm like, I'm pretty good at deflecting and I make a lot of self-deprecating jokes and I'll be the first person to kind of make fun of myself. And that's a really, really important defense mechanism when you're doing this kind of job where you're putting yourself out there a lot. It is this balance of like, I'm going to put myself out there and be vulnerable, but if you're not going to accept that, then I also will make fun of myself and kind of moonwalk out of this situation. (laughs) Um, You have to be able to like live your life. (laughs) You can't cry all the time. Yeah. And you can't feel everything all the time. Um, In terms of being a functioning human, absolutely. You need both sides of things. I would be a wreck if I let my vulnerable side dominate my life. What about the practice of sharing music with people to help you explore your own feelings. Cause I read somewhere it's, you said it makes it easier every time you play a song that was, that you were like kind of unsure about, or that was difficult to write. It, it, it gets easier every time you perform it in front of people. Yeah. So one of the songs is a song called footnote. And I wrote that song because at the time my, now husband and I had been together for a long time, but he wasn't sure if he wanted to get married and I didn't know where things were going and it was really stressful. And I'd, I'd kind of felt very, very like how much of this is like replaceable? Like how much of what I feel like is so special, um, 
is gonna be just something that happened to you like just somebody that you used to know really well and that was like that was a really hard idea to kind of wrap my head around and feel comfortable with um and when I started playing it I felt really awkward again because my husband was on stage with me but also because I felt like that was a really I don't know. I don't like feeling, I don't mind being vulnerable. I don't like feeling weak. And that to me felt like a song where I kind of felt like this weak girl who was like, oh, you're going to love somebody else. And I, I had a hard time with that. But every time I played it, you know, it was just this feeling of like the whole, the whole room got really quiet. It's quite a quiet song. The whole room got really quiet. And I could just, you could just kind of feel that people got it. And it was, even though I'd written it from very much, you know, my own lady perspective <laughs> it it resonated with a lot of people and that was so comforting because all of a sudden it was like first of all I'm not a weirdo for obsessing about this and thinking about this all the time and second of all we're all making this decision that like love is really scary and we're all continuing to do it and that was really beautiful to feel that show after show of people being like, I feel the same way or I felt that way. And yet we're all still doing it. And so there's like this, I don't know, like I, I feel like lots of people come to shows when they come up to me afterwards and they're like, oh, you know, that meant so much to me. And every time they say that, it means so much to me because I'm like, oh, thank heavens. Can you imagine if I wrote this song and everybody was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you're being ridiculous. Um, there's all these things that I've and I obsessed over that concept for a long time like three years because he had a girlfriend before me and for three years I was like what does that mean like he said I love you to somebody else and as soon as I wrote the song and started playing it I stopped worrying about it because I was like well everybody else has been in this boat and they're all still doing it so I can still do it you know Recently, you received a grant to write a new album. Congratulations. This is like brand Thank new you. news. Yes. So what will that look like? And what does that well, mean to receive that grant for you? Like it must take a huge burden away in terms of like financing your life. I feel like a millionaire. It's not <laughs> a millionaire's amount of money. But um, yeah, I found out at the end of February that I'd gotten this grant and I wrote it like in a two day stint in October, I didn't even know about the grant because I'm really bad at being on top of things. But um, I wrote the grant and I was like, what are some things I would in my dream world, what would I like to do? And I was like, well, I'd love to like go on a writing retreat and I'd love to go to Nashville and I'd love to just take two months to like work on a record. And the Canada Arts Council is this amazing group and they just give money to artists to just do art, which is insane. Um yeah. And so I'd never thought I would get it. And then at the end of February, I got this lovely email and this was right as the world was kind of falling apart. So the whole, <laughs> the whole project has, has had to take a couple different turns. I did a little writing retreat for two weeks <laughs> in March, literally as all the, as all the, uh, like quarantine orders were coming out. And so I flew to Edmonton, got there like two days later, everything shut down and I, I had to cut it short. I came back after like a week and a half. And then I was supposed to be in Nashville this month, I should have gotten back like two days ago, but I obviously couldn't do that. So I've had to rework some things, but it's already been, oh, and I've been writing with, uh, I got to do a couple writing lessons with Margaret Glaspie. Do you know Margaret Glaspie? Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it was so cool. So I did like five, she, she was offering online lessons with people. And so I did like five lessons with her um, over the last six months. And that was really great. Um, and then the way that this Nashville portion of money has been moved around. I'm doing some um, <laughs> online mentoring with uh, Kim Ritchie. Do you know Kim Ritchie? Nice. Yes. She's yeah, who I met through the BAMF Center. Oh, I love her to death. She and I have been meeting like twice a week over the past month. And sometimes we work on songs together. And sometimes she just tells me about the bread that she's baking. And it's great. She's um, like, she seems like such a fun hang, like such a good buddy. She is the definition of a good buddy. And I'm so actually relieved, like not relieved. This is a horrible situation that the world is in, but, um, but I never would have gotten to spend this much time with her if I had, uh, done a trip to Nashville. Um, cause I was only going to go for like two weeks. So we probably, we would have like 
met one time to do a writing session. And now basically she's taking on a bit of a mentorship role. Her and John Henry, who I also met through the BAM Center, is also a great songwriter. Um, so they're like looking at songs that I'm working on for the record and they're giving me some pointers and we're doing a little bit of co-writing together. And that's really amazing. And then July and August, I get to not work at all and just like finish up this record and do arranging. And I've never... I've never in my entire life had this much time to like just be creative Mm. and not only to like be creative, but to not feel like a garbage human being for doing it because I'll be like, I really should be like working or I spent the last two years like saving up all this money and now I'm going to spend it all in two months. Like it's a really incredible, there's a little bit of pressure attached to it, but um, mostly I just feel like I'm so happy. Mm. I'm so happy and I'm so honored and, and, um, I feel this really intense um, excitement to try and write the best songs I've ever written and and kind of push myself as a songwriter. And I've never had the luxury of doing that before. It's always kind of been like, oh, I wrote some songs. Let's go to the studio. Um, so I do feel like I've won the lottery. Yeah, I hope it validates you immensely because what you do is so important. And I think during uh, quarantine, it has been so clear to me just like working at Club Passim and working with all these streaming shows and like making sure that people still have a connection to music and performance. It's very necessary, you know, because what mm-hmm. you do helps us understand ourselves. So keep doing it. Thanks. I will. Well, for now, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Let's wipe our tears. <laughs> Yeah, away. Get them all out. And uh, let's do the lightning round. Oh, I didn't get to this part of the interview. I don't even know what this is, but I'm excited. Oh, boy. Here we go. What is the first song you learned on the guitar? Uh, The first cut is The Deepest by Cat Stevens. But really, I was thinking of the Cheryl Crow version. Batman or Superman? (laughs) Batman. Karaoke song? Um, Total Eclipse of the Heart. Favorite radio station as a kid? Mix 96, which I don't think exists anymore. Is it like, like a Edmonton. like a hot adult contemporary station? It's like the 90s and now, Mix 96. They play Cheryl Crow and Pink. Yeah, and like Michelle Branch. Yeah, it's All like really for moms. Avril Lavigne. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, for moms and me. Me yeah. and my mom. Yes. Um, dogs or cats? Dogs. Wow. That was surprised. I'm surprised. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, thank, oh, thank well, you. <laughs> thank you so much. It's because it's because I have a really my parents have a really great dog and the the only cat that and also I liked cats more. Um, and then for a year we were house sitting for somebody and they had a cat and it was the worst cat ever and it's ruined cats for me. I also have a cat that has ruined cats for me, but it's because she's so great. Oh well, yeah. I've met cats like that, too, where I'm like, I think I could love cats again. But the cat that we had to take care of, like, straight up would just pee on the counter and, like, eat my clothes and drool. And I couldn't do puzzles because she would eat the puzzles while we were sleeping. She was the worst. I know how you feel about puzzles. Yeah. What's your your favorite puzzle? Oh, it's a love-hate relationship. We have an MC Escher puzzle. And it's horrifyingly hard. And I hate it while we're doing it. But also, I think quarantine has made me really crave a challenge. Mm. So I'm going to go with our MC. It's, it's like the it's like a self-portrait. And it's just all pencil marking. So you can't tell what anything is. It's, it's disgusting. Oh, my I love God. It. Yeah. First album you bought with your own money? It was Avril Lavigne. And it was um, her first album, which is gold. Solid gold. What was your first concert? This is like the definition of my parents being too poor to take us to anything. I think the first concert I went to was um, the Edmonton Folk Festival when I was 11 or 12. Oh, wow. What was the last book you read? I'm in the middle of uh, the Alice Network, which is Heather's Pick. I'm reading a lot of light (laughs) books during quarantine. (laughs) But this one's not light. It's about uh, Heather from Chapters, Indigo. It's a Heather's Pick. Oh. Doesn't, isn't it Heather? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's like the sticker. It's like Oprah's pick, but it's oh, Heather. Oh, okay. He- but so I don't know. Heather is a famous person, and it's her pick. I think so. 
I don't actually know who she is either, but I always trust her advice. <laughs> if it's got a Heather's pick sticker, I'm like, well, Heather said so. She would never do me wrong. What is your dream collaboration? Anais Mitchell. Mm. I actually, when I got this grant, I was like, I should just like, and I had all this extra money. I was like, I should just reach out to people and like, see if they would give me lessons. Because Margaret Glaspie is another, like, I love Margaret Glaspie. And I knew that Anais Mitchell just had a baby. So that was the excuse I used. And my, I was like, ah, oh, she probably wouldn't do it. And she's just had a baby. And my band member was like, you should ask her. Like, it's quarantine. People are just like sitting around. She might be willing to do it. And I was like, I think I would actually die. <laughs> I've, I've met her twice. Uh, after concerts and I do that thing where like I don't want her to know how much I like her so I'm like a little mean <laughs> I'm like I'm like will you like sign my CD or whatever and she's like yeah and she's so nice and I just can't I can't do it so yeah that's that's who I would want to collaborate with flying or invisibility invisibility Lord of the Rings or Narnia Lord of the Rings Harry Potter or Hunger Games Harry Potter. That's not even a... <laughs> it's not even a thing. Sorry, I apologize. Star Trek yeah. or Star Wars? Star Wars. I wish I could say Star Trek because I think it's cooler, but I've just never gotten into it. And Star Wars is great. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? I'm going to say Cape Breton. Canada's got some solid gold places you know i haven't traveled that much outside of canada i've gone to scotland which was amazing but uh i went to cape breton for like a day and a half and it was the most magical like we did the whole we did as much sightseeing as we could in in a day and a half and it was what's it like you get your money's worth uh it's um so it's coastal it's like a it's like a semi-island in off of nova scotia it's just coastal and and it's really fascinating because half of the there's this loop that you can drive around this whole kind of inlet island thing. I don't know what an inlet is, but it's not a full-on <laughs> island. Um, you can drive it in a day. It's only like four hours long. You can drive around the whole island. But half of the island was like settled by French people. So it's like very French. And then half the island was settled by Gaelic. I just looked up some pictures. It looks great. I'm not going to try to describe it's it because I know that Cape Breton is a style of music that people who fiddle mm -hmm. um, and I think it is Celtic yeah uh, so it's it's like this very it's a very very cool place to be just culturally there's so much going on and there's really cool music and there's lots of seafood and there's trees and stuff it's beautiful awesome well that's it you did it that's the end of the lightning round yay we had a great time um, you have won a the, car a car uh, wow. That um, you, it's an invisible car. Perfect. It'll go with my new invisibility skill. Nice. Thank you for talking to me. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for talking with me. I'm so honored. Can't wait to hang out in real life. Yeah. You know, in two or three years. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, Danielle, I really Great. appreciate it. Thank you. Basic Folk, produced by Laura McCarthy this week. Also producer Adam Corey and our business manager, Lindsay Myers. Alex Stanton of Townspeople does our music. I'm your host, Cindy Howes. Hope you enjoyed this podcast today. If you liked what you heard, you can subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can share with a friend. There are 71 full episodes available. You can listen at my website, cindyhouse.net, or wherever you get your podcast. And we'll talk to you later, okay? Hope you are doing well, okay? Thanks. Bye.